Hi friends, welcome to Learn With Unknown. Have you ever heard regarding any person with age just 32 years changed the way we used to look at mathematics? He did not produce just some mathematical interpretations, but even today still we have a lot his groundbreaking handwritten raw papers, which are an unanswered brainstorming session for best mathematicians across the world. Today we're diving into the extraordinary journey of Srinivasa Ramanujan. Some of his best appreciations are Srinivasa Ramanujan was the strangest man in all of mathematics, probably in the entire history of science. He has been compared to a bursting supernova illuminating the darkest, most profound corners of mathematics before being tragically struck down by tuberculosis at the age of 32, like Riemann before him, Michio Kaku, G. H. Hardy, Ramanujan's mentor, contrived an informal scale of mathematical ability on which he assigned himself a 25 and Littlewood a 30. To David Hilbert, the most eminent mathematician of the day, he assigned an 80. To Ramanujan, he gave a 100, Robert Canigal, Ramanujan's biographer. He was a 20th century Indian mathematician who made substantial contributions to analytic number theory, infinite series, and continued fractions. He received no formal training in pure mathematics. By teaching himself from an outdated mathematics textbook in a short lifetime, he produced almost 4,000 proofs, identities, conjectures and relations. With much of his work having opened active areas of research and his work finding applications in fields such as physics and probability, some of his notable contributions include finding new properties of Bernoulli numbers, his rapid approximation to PE, and the hearty Ramanujan partition formula. Born on December 22, 1887 in Erodi, India, Ramanujan showed exceptional mathematical prowess from an early age. He was born into a poor Brahmin family. Ramanujan's parents were Kupu Swami Srinivasa Inga, a man who worked as a clerk in a shop, and Kamala Tamil, a housewife who brought in a little bit of money by singing at the local temple. She nursed him through an attack of the dreaded smallpox that devastated the region when he was just two. Despite facing financial difficulties, he demonstrated a natural gift for numbers and embarked on a journey that would eventually lead him to become one of the greatest mathematicians in history. His most of the work later found handwritten just like this image here where he analyzed a geometric construction of a square whose area is equal to that of a given circle. Let's explore his early life first. In November 1897, just before turning 10, he passed his primary exams for each subject with flying colors, the best in the district, in fact. Ramanujan's early life was marked by a deep fascination with numbers and mathematical concepts. Largely self-taught, he made significant discoveries in isolation, oblivious to the mathematical advancements occurring globally. His lack of formal education did not hinder his passion, and by the time he was a teenager, he had independently developed complex theorems and formulas. He was lent a book on advanced trigonometry by S. L. Loney, which he not only mastered quickly but also made many sophisticated discoveries on his own. In 1902, Ramanujan showed how to solve cubic equations as well as developing his own method for solving cortex. He also attempted to develop a method for solving quintics the following year, which ultimately failed as it was impossible using square roots. In 1903, Ramanujan's real journey began when, at the age of 15, he stumbled upon George Shoebridge Carr's synopsis of elementary results in pure and applied mathematics. This collection of theorems ignited his genius, and he went beyond Carr's work, developing his own theorems and ideas. This was perhaps the first spark of the supernova that would soon draw compelling attention in the mathematical firmament. Ramanujan independently developed and investigated Bernoulli numbers and also calculated the Euler-Macaroni constant up to 15 decimal places. In the same year, he secured a scholarship to the University of Madras but lost it due to his single-minded focus on mathematics. Undeterred, he persisted living in poverty and working tirelessly. Ramanujan's mother decided that a solution to his misfortunes lay in his marriage to a nine-year-old girl consistent with the practice of child marriages widely prevalent in Hindu society. In 1910, Ramanujan met with V. Ramaswamy Iyer, the founder of the Indian Mathematical Society or IMS. He wanted a job in the revenue department with Iyer and showed him his mathematical notebooks. Aya was ecstatic about the work and wrote letters of recommendation to his friends around Madras. 
among those friends being Ramachandra Rao, an Indian mathematician and civil servant. While impressed, he doubted the work was Ramanujan's own, but after speaking with a few professors about this, he gave Ramanujan another chance which led to Ramanujan finally getting financial aid as a researcher and getting his work published in the Journal of the IMS. Ramanujan was soon to end up as a class the three grade four accounts clerk at a salary of rupees 30 per month in the Madras Port Trust office and was happy with it considering that he had no college degree and the job afforded sufficient spare time for his mathematical pursuits. More significantly, his immediate boss was Mr. S. Narayana Iyer, who was the treasurer of the Indian Mathematical Association and an admirer. Also, the head of the Port Trust itself was Sir Francis Spring, who had also been tremendously impressed with his mathematical research. Such contacts enabled him to get several of his research findings published in the Journal of the Indian Mathematical Society, enhancing his reputation as a mathematical genius of exceptional merit. Earlier, one of the professional mathematicians who had encouraged him greatly and appreciated his work was P. V. Seshu Iyer, a professor at Pachayapas College where Ramanujan had actually failed. In 1913, Rao tried to present Ramanujan's work to British mathematicians at University College of London's Mr. Micaiah John Muller Hill, a 19th and 20th century mathematician known for his spherical vortex and tetrahedra, he found Ramanujan's work to be lacking and didn't offer to take him on as a student, but he did give him professional advice expressing that Ramanujan had a taste for mathematics. After that, Ramanujan kept reaching other mathematicians too. It is evident to understand that in these tough times of almost 10 years, in between 1903 and 1914, it is believed that he worked upon a lot of notebooks. Today, his major handwritten content is available in four notebooks. One, first notebook. It contains 16 chapters across 134 pages and include topics like Q-series and theta functions. Two, second notebook. It's an expanded version of the first with 21 chapters spanning 252 pages. It covers topics like number theory, elliptic functions and modular equations. Oh, third notebook. It contains 33 unorganized pages of material. These notebooks accompanied Ramanujan to Cambridge, although he didn't have time to explore them during his stay abroad. The contents of these notebooks are a goldmine of mathematical insights, often lacking formal proofs. For the lost notebook, notably there exists a set of loose and unordered sheets known as Ramanujan's Lost Notebook. These sheets, totaling more than 100 pages, feature over 600 mathematical formulas listed consecutively without proofs. The lost notebook was discovered in 1976 by mathematician George E. Andrews after decades of obscurity. Apart from the said four notebooks, Ramanujan's other notebooks remain largely unpublished. These notebooks contain a wealth of mathematical gems awaiting further exploration and publication. All his available original handbooks and scripted links are mentioned in the video description. Most of them are combined by Cambridge and Trinity. Now let's again come back to year 1913. In the same year, Ramanujan's work caught the attention of G. H. Hardy, a leading mathematician at Cambridge University. His covering letter said in part, I have not trodden through the university course, but am striking out a new path for myself. I have made a special investigation of divergent series in general, and the results I get are termed by the local mathematicians as startling, being poor. If you are convinced that there is anything of value, I would like to have my theorems published. I have not given the actual investigations nor the expressions I get, but I have indicated the lines on which I proceed. He was trying to invoke both pity and admiration at the same time, but in effect was only seeking recognition of the international mathematical community. He was impressed by his work on hypergeometric series and expressed that he was defeated upon seeing his work on continued fractions. He apparently said the results must be true because if they're not true, no one would have the imagination to invent them. Hardy even said the letters were the most remarkable he'd ever received and described Ramanujan as a mathematician of the highest quality, a man of altogether exceptional originality and power. He sought a second opinion from his great friend and younger professional colleague J.E. Littlewood, who also felt the same way. With a mixture of perplexity and amazement, Hardy concluded that Ramanujan's claims must be true because if they were not, no one could have the imagination to invent them. 
Hardy wrote Ramanujan back discussing his interest, but highlighted that it was of the utmost importance that he sees proofs of the work that was sent as most of what was sent was proposition result with no in-between. In particular, he complained that most of the findings stated in the form of end results without the intermediate steps involved in arriving at them required to be proved with the kind of rigor that was the hallmark of mathematics as a discipline. He wanted Ramanujan to send proofs to buttress his claims. On his part, Ramanujan had not paid much attention to such finer points, having very often arrived at the final results through a gigantic leap of his intuition and imagination. Later, Hardy recognized Ramanujan's brilliance and started to facilitate him for his journey to England. The coast was now clear for Ramanujan to go to Cambridge and show the world what he was worth. Ramanujan departed from Madras to England on 17 March 1914. Hardy and Littlewood both examined all of Ramanujan's notebooks in detail, and what they discovered was even more amazing than what they had been led to believe from their previous correspondence with him. Here was someone without any formal education beyond high school, coming up with some of the most astounding discoveries in the entire history of mathematics, a realization that could not have come to anyone but people of their own caliber. His discoveries were absolutely new and original and it was now left to these and other mathematical scholars to make them known in the world of mathematics. There were many so utterly confounding to them that years and even decades were to pass before they could be deciphered, understood and established. Soon after Ramanujan and Hardy met in Cambridge, they started a very fruitful collaboration, each having had a great deal to learn from the other. This collaboration resulted in groundbreaking theorems, including the now famous Ramanujan Hardy number 1729, known as the Hardy Ramanujan taxicab number. There is an interesting story behind this number, which was explained by Hardy himself. I remember once going to see him when he was ill at Putney. I had ridden in taxicab number 1729 and remarked that the number seemed to me rather a dull one and that I hoped it was not an unfavorable omen. No, Ramanujan replied, it is a very interesting number. It is the smallest number expressible as the sum of two cubes in two different ways. The two different ways 1729 is expressible as the sum of two cubes. The number has since become known as the Hardy Ramanujan number, the second so-called taxicab number. If we now go a bit deep in mathematics so far, six taxicab numbers are known. They are mentioned here. You may pause the video to look at them one by one. Let's come back to his mind-boggling journey once again. One of the professors had remarked that Ramanujan was in England at the most unfortunate time due to World War I. There were about 700 students before the war, but this number was reduced to 150 by November 1915. It is interesting to understand that Ramanujan looked at complex problems as he truly painting the picture and the way in which he approached problems was quite different. From mathematicians like Neville and Littlewood, who would build his theory in a brick-by-brick -brick fashion, whereas Ramanujan would do his calculations, find out the interesting and significant facts about them, and then would build his theory. Even after showing such incredible talent, Trinity College kept delaying his fellowship. In 1918, ignoring the Trinity College fellowship fiasco, Hardy and the 11 other reputed mathematicians decided that Ramanujan was worthy of an even greater honor, the Fellowship of the Royal Society of England, and nominated him for this. Earlier, he had been elected a Fellow of the London Mathematical Society in whose proceedings quite a number of his papers had been published. Soon enough, Ramanujan received the enthralling news from Hardy that the Royal Society had indeed decided to confer him its fellowship in 1918. So the college dropout from South India now became an FRS, one of the youngest ever to get this honor, and only the second Indian to do so. Now that this had happened, it was easy for Trinity College to follow suit and confer him its own fellowship that he had been denied earlier. The lesser honor came Ramanujan's way after the greater honor. In 1919, Ramanujan got into a state of depression caused by a variety of factors, including his increasing personal problems both in England and back home in Madras. In one fatefully weak moment, he tried to commit suicide by throwing himself onto a railway track in the London underground system. The whole episode was hushed up through Hardy's diplomatic intervention with the police authorities. 
Ramanujan recovered from this incident for some time, buoyed up by the academic honors that came his way, but the reprieve was short-lived. His health deteriorated sharply and he had to spend time in several sanatoria for tuberculosis patients where the conditions, particularly the food, were intolerable for him. Hardy advised that it was time for Ramanujan to return home, at least temporarily, a suggestion acceptable to all concerned, since the World War had also come to an end. When he returned to India on 27 March 1919, Ramanujan's health had deteriorated to such an extent that his old friends and admirers back home saw the writing on the wall clearly and tried to prop him up as much as possible. Aided by numerous felicitations and honors showered upon him from all quarters in Madras, including a professorship at the university which he had not been able to dream of joining even as a student. Ramanujan spent his last days in Madras in great agony, both physical and mental, but his mathematical productivity wasn't affected much. Unknown to most people, he had been working on what was to be his magnum opus, a new and exciting class of functions called mock theta functions. When he met his end on 26 April 1920 in Madras, aged just 32, the papers containing these and other discoveries were found by his wife and passed on to Cambridge through various channels and got lost somewhere there, fortunately to be rediscovered decades later. Impact on Mathematics Some of the more prominent discoveries with which Ramanujan's name is permanently engraved in the history of mathematics are Landau Ramanujan constant, mock theta functions, Ramanujan conjecture, Ramanujan prime, Ramanujan Soldner constant, Ramanujan theta function, Ramanujan sum, Rogers Ramanujan identities, and Ramanujan's master theorem. Legacy and impact. Srinivasa Ramanujan, the self taught mathematical genius, left an indelible mark on the world of numbers. In his honor, Ramanujan has appeared on stamps issued by the government of India from time to time. It is not extravagant to say that he truly became the greatest mathematician of his time. What he actually did is wonderful enough. If you enjoyed the video, please click that like button and subscribe. As always, thank you for watching and I'll catch you next time.